<clears throat> One correction, that is a creek ending rather than the Cree. C-R-E-E-K, creek, known as the Muscogean. And so there are about 400 tribes of Indians in the United States. And so we're going to be working with them to get a, a national holiday for the American Indians. And there are a lot of holidays for other people, and uh, we don't uh, object to this. And we're glad to share our lush lands here in America. We think there's enough land to go around, but on the other hand, uh, we think we've been bypassed. And the original Americans, and there's not a holiday for us, and uh, we're a little upset about that. So I hope you people will go along with me, and if it ever comes to vote, Johnny, I'm looking for your vote. So uh, <clears throat> glad to be here tonight, uh, hearing the speech that just closed, when Deed was wonderful. But the hires, I believe, to be one of the great preachers among us today. And I do believe that there is too much division, jealousy, and hatred among preachers, elders of the country. And I certainly would like it to be known. And if anyone uh, has all against me, we can settle it right quickly. We're brethren. I'd be glad to uh, work with you in the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm here and throughout my work to do all the good that I can do, and no harm at all. A few moments ago, uh, Alan made reference to uh, the difference that exists among preachers. And I know that uh, to be very true. In California, a few years ago, we had two men, J.D. Tant and John Ellen Hudson. I don't know that any of you ever knew Brother John Ellen Hudson. I'm sure that Perry Coffin does. John Ellen Hudson was one of the great scholars among us and great orators. When you would go to listen to him preach, you had to take a dictionary. Lloyd Thompson and I one day heard him speak. And after he got through speaking, we went up to the platform to see if he left any notes. And sure enough, he did. But neither one of us brought a dictionary, and so we couldn't even read his notes. So we had some trouble along that line. Well, someone in California made a tragic mistake. They planned the lectureship, and they had John Ellen Hudson and J.D. Tant speaking the same night. Brother John Allen Hudson dressed, his shoes were so shine you practically see yourself in his shoes. His suits looked like the suits of band conductors, orchestra directors. Brother J.D. Tant had an old tweed suit on that evening. I think he had a brown sock and a blue sock. <laughs> it didn't make any difference to him. He was fully dressed as far as he was concerned. They had John Allen Hudson to be the first speaker, and you can well imagine what an oration that was. Came Brother J.D. Tatt's time to speak, and uh, he had a little nasal tone or talk when he decided to talk, which was most of the time. So uh, he gets up to speak, and he said, Before God, brethren, reverend in holy name. Never heard such a beautiful speech in all of my life. It was beautiful. John sat there, reared back, J.D. Tant bragging on him. Said he soared among the Milky Way. He hopped from star to star. John was just thoroughly elated now that Brother Tant was doing all that bragging on him. But then he said, before God, brethren, in reverend to the holy name, only God and John knew what he was talking about. <laughs> So there's a difference in preachers. <clears throat> but you know both of them preach the word of God. And that's what I am endeavoring to do here tonight. I've heard some beautiful uh, sermons since I've been here. A sermon that I heard with Brother Leroy Brownlow ought to be taped and sent all over the country. If we ever needed a sermon like that, Brother Brownlow did an excellent job. Those of you that missed it, get that tape. You don't want to go away and uh, not have that one because it's one that ought to be had by everyone everywhere. Now tonight we look at a passage of scripture 
And John 6 and verses 44 and verse 45. Jesus says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. I raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and learned of the Father cometh unto me. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Look at Isaiah chapter 54 and at verse 13. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord. Then in John 6 verse 45, it's written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that heard and learned the Father cometh unto me. God, our Heavenly Father, is the teacher. We read in Isaiah 2 and verse 4. He shall teach us of his ways. God is the teacher. The subject that God uses to teach is his ways. He will teach us of his ways. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. The result of being taught the ways of God will be to walk in his paths. God assumes the responsibility of being our teacher. He wants us instructed. He does not want us to have the doctrines of men. There is a vast difference, a worldwide difference between being taught of God, being taught of man, what will be the result of being taught of man? We read in Matthew, the 15th chapter, in verse 9. Jesus says, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Some people read the Bible in order to criticize it. Some people read the Bible to learn the truth. Some people read the Bible to uh, find something wrong with it. But you know something? We have no right whatsoever to criticize the Bible. There are a lot of people today who are doing just this very thing. They are criticizing the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Listen and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. A deserter. Here is the divine critic. This book sets upon us to criticize us. We have no right whatsoever to criticize the Bible. Here is man's critic, the Bible itself. Some people have endeavored to find a contradiction. In John the 12th chapter and verse 32, along with John the 6th chapter and verse 44, then uh, what do we learn? Well, we find there is no contradiction. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This passage says God, or the Lord draws, Jesus draws. But in John the 6th chapter, verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me, draw him. So many people say, here is a contradiction in the Bible. Robert Owen, the great infidel, Ingersoll, they said these two passages of Scripture show that the Bible has some flaws in it. The Bible contradicts itself. Well, these two men are wrong. They need to read another passage of Scripture, which is 1 John 5 and verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God and the Father agree in purpose and in works. Hence, there is no contradiction existing between John the 12th chapter, verse 32, and John the 6th chapter, and verse 44. They shall all be taught of God. This certainly shows that the doctrine of the direct operation of Spirit is in error. They shall all be taught of God. 
If all men are to be taught of God, then the doctrine of the direct operation of the Spirit cannot be a correct position. There are a number of kinds of drawing. There is physical drawing that we read about in John's Gospel, chapter 21 and verse 11. And drew the net to land. This is physical drawing. Men take a net and they draw it to land. I've many times looked out in the country fields to see draft horses and large animals, mules. And they're hitched to something, a plow, a wagon, maybe a stump. That is physical drawing. Then there is his irresistible drawing. Take that mob that took Paul and Silas. And the record says they drew him unto the marketplace. Here is irresistible drawing. Like a policeman takes a criminal, puts him in handcuffs, takes his head and pushes it down and pushes him in the back seat of a car, a patrol car. Take him handcuffed, bound to jail. There is irresistible drawing. But on the other hand, there is moral drawing. When the Apostle Paul was taking his leave from the shores of Miletus, he calls unto him the Ephesian elders and says, Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them, Acts the twentieth chapter and uh, verse thirty. We'll read also in Acts the fifth chapter in verse th uh, thirty-seven that after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the day of taxing, and drew much drew away much people after him. Well, here is moral drawing, drawn away through teaching, drawn away from in by instruction. This kind of a drawing. I'd like for all of you to look very carefully to see about uh, the things of moral drawing. Something that we need to learn. Jesus said in John 8th chapter, verse 32, He said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, we need to learn about this truth. That makes free. If uh, the truth makes free. Jesus said in John 17 and verse 17. Sanctify them father through thy word. Thy word is truth. I'd like for each of you to know. That truth is information. And information is taught. We can see the advantage. The importance of the word of God. Truth is information, and uh, information is taught. Our question now comes, why is divine drawing needed? Divine drawing is needed between because God and the alien sinner are apart. Some of you may wonder why I use the expression alien sinner. I have been called in question about using this terminology alien sinner. I say it for good reason. There is a reason for referring to an alien sinner. Now why do we call him an alien sinner? One who has not obeyed the gospel. In Ephesians, the second chapter and verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. Do you know what a commonwealth is? A commonwealth is a kingdom. Commonwealth, citizens of a kingdom. Citizens of a government. If you're not a member of that government, not a citizen of that kingdom, you're an alien. You're aliens from the commonwealth. And so today, people who have not obeyed the gospel, who are not in the kingdom of God, our Lord, and our Savior, they are alien sinners. They're aliens because they're not in the commonwealth. They're not in the kingdom of our God. But let us look at Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned every one his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you know why Isaiah in chapter 53 and verse 6 would be inspired to pen what he did? God and the sinner are apart. Why are they apart? They are apart because of sin. Isaiah the 59th chapter in verse 2. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you. That he will not hear. God and the sinner are apart. God didn't leave the sinner. The sinner has left God. It's up to the sinner to come back. When uh, Jesus says, no man can come to the Father or come to me except of the Father. Except the Father draw him. A lot of good people have taken this to mean that man does not have the power of choice. This is wrong. Man does have the power of choice. We look at John, the seventh chapter, and verse 37. And in that uh, day, the last day, the day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried. He said, let him that is a thirst come unto me and drink. So man can come. The last verse of the Bible, the closing chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the bride say come. Let him that heareth say come. Let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Have you ever stopped to consider why the vast majority of mankind is unsaved today? Why? Why are so many unsaved? Is it because God is withholding saving power? Is it that God does not want men to be saved? Why are they unsaved? We get John the fifth chapter in verse 40. Jesus said, You will not come to me that you might have life. Question now comes, what kind of power does God use to draw? What kind of power? God doesn't use physical power. That's not the way he draws. God does not use irresistible power. God doesn't use compulsory power. But how does God draw the sinner? How does he draw he does it morally. He does it through teaching. Not through the law of Moses. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 19. The law made nothing perfect. But the bringing in of a better hope did. By which we draw nigh to God. Just look at that simple declarative passage of scripture. The Old Testament doesn't draw people today to God. The New Testament draws people to God. By which... That means the New Testament. We don't go to the Old Testament to find out what to do to be saved. We go to the New Testament. We cannot go to the doctrines and commandments of men to learn what to do to be saved. Take the Galatians. They had obeyed the gospel, but then they wanted to go back to a religion with Jewish observances. And uh, Paul was afraid of them. And... Uh, we hear him say in Galatians 1 in verse 8, Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any of the gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He previously said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calls you in the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Hence the doctrines and commandments of man are perversions of the doctrine of Christ. They will not save. This is not what we need to be saved by today. What do we need? We are saved by moral power. I read in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the salvation to everyone that believeth the Jew first, and also the Greek. God has many powers. Power of adhesion is the power of God. Power of gravitation is another power of God. Power of suffocation. Here's another power of God. 
God Almighty does not use the power of suffocation to save the human soul. God does not use his power of gravitation, adhesion, coercion, or whatever. God only has one power to save the soul of man, and that's the book that I hold in my hand. It is the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Here is God's power. Not God's power to move dirt. Not God's power to move rocks. But here is God's power to save the human soul. I turn next to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. This is how we're called today. Brother George Dehoff and I recently were on a talk show in uh, Tennessee. We were on about some other things, and uh, we got on to the Bible. And it was back when Jim Baker was having his first trouble with the law. And uh, attention was called to Jim Baker. And uh, the, the show host the, of the talk show, he said, Joe said, would you like to tell the audience Speaking on the, the program, tell people how you were called to preach. He was going to think that perhaps I saw a sign in the sky said, Joe, go to preach. He thought I was going to talk about something like that. And you know what I did? I went to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel. We got into the Bible so strongly. He only had us on for five minutes, and he says, we're going to take a break here for about five minutes, and I'm coming back, and I'm going to be the uh, host on another talk show. And he said, Joe, would you continue what you're talking about? I never heard anything like this in all of my life. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Did you know there are preachers all over the, this nation that do not know that passage in the Scripture? And they think they have some kind of a direct calling. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. Here the apostle Peter in Acts the 15th chapter in verse 7. You know that God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. What? Hear the word of the gospel and believe. Right here is a good time to learn a great lesson. God has ordained that man shall preach unto man. We look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. This treasure is the gospel. I am an earthly vessel. Christ is a heavenly vessel. Angels are heavenly vessels. The Holy Spirit is a heavenly vessel. <coughs> heavenly vessels do not tell men what to do to be saved. We have this treasure the gospel. In earthen vessels, remember what Jesus said to Ananias, speaking of Saul, Acts the ninth chapter in verse 15, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. We today may be chosen vessels. Second Timothy 2 verse 21, if any man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, made for the master's use. So anyone today, an earthen vessel, fills up with the Bible that wants to go out and tell lost man what to do to be saved, you're an earthen vessel. We now look to a number of passages showing that God has ordained that man preached to man. We call to mind Saul of Tarsus, journeying from Jerusalem to Damascus to persecute Christians. Light shining around above the brightness of the sun, and when Saul was fallen to the ground, heard a voice speaking unto him in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul asked, Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. I want you to hear verse 6. Lord, what will you have me to do? Here would be a good place for the Lord to tell Saul what to do to be saved. But the Lord is a heavenly vessel. 
And there's a preacher waiting down in Damascus by the name of Ananias. And that was to be an earthen vessel's job to tell Saul what to do. Hear the Lord. Arise and go in the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. Then in the city of Damascus, we have later Ananias speaking to Saul. Now why tarest thou, arise and be baptized. <coughs> Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now why didn't the Lord tell Paul that some three days before? Why? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Then an angel says to a gospel preacher by the name of Philip, Go toward the south, and the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Philip did. He found an Ethiopian, a treasure of Queen Candace. And this uh, nobleman was reading Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and didn't understand it. Then the Spirit said to the preacher, Join thyself to this chariot. Philip said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, How can I accept some man guide me? He desired Philip he'd come up and sit with him. Philip began at the same scripture, preached unto him Jesus. Now why didn't the angel do that? Why didn't the angel? The angel was there. And yet the angel told the preacher, Go to the way it goes down south from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. Why didn't the angel tell him? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Take the case of Cornelius, the first Gentile convert to Christianity. Let's apply the principle. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. But now Cornelius was told to send to Joppa for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Holy Spirit, why didn't you tell Cornelius what to do to be saved? Why? We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Hear what the Spirit said. Why send for Peter? Acts 11 chapter verses 13 and 14. Who shall tell thee words whereby that thou and all of thy house shall be saved? Christ is a heavenly vessel. Man is an earthly vessel. God has ordained that man preach unto man in the Bible. In salvation, we find there has to be a begetting. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15, Paul said, I have begotten you through the gospel. In conversion, there has to be a quickening, making alive. Thy word hath quickened me, said David in Psalms 119 and verse 40. In conversion, we have to be made clean. Jesus said, Now you're clean for the word which I have spoken unto you. John, the 15th chapter and verse 3. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25, in other words, this is the word which is preached, or the gospel which is preached unto you. Hence we are saved by the word. I'd like to look in this connection to John, the 4th chapter and verse 35. Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look on the field. They are white, all ready to harvest. It doesn't take anything to look. It doesn't require any effort to look. This isn't what Jesus meant. Just look out on the field and see things are ripe for a harvest. That isn't what Jesus had in mind. Jesus meant there must be some priorities in our lives. Some things must be first and some things must be secondary. We can't go out and work with this world if we're lazy. We have to have our minds made up with a determinate effort to preach a definite gospel, the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But it takes a definite effort. We can't just merely look on the fields. And this is what we're doing around my area in San Francisco and Oakland. We're looking on the fields. There are thousands of unsaved people in the very shadows of this building. What are we doing? 
We're just looking on the fields and it doesn't require any effort to do that. But I want to tell you, you cannot improve upon the apostles' message. Why is it that you can't improve upon the apostles' message? Simply because what they preached, they didn't think of it. No apostle would ever thought about the Lord's Supper. No apostle would ever have thought about being baptized in water. No wonder then the Spirit said to the apostles, He said, Don't take heed how or what you shall speak. It shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Matthew the 10th chapter, verses 19 and 20. These men, when they spoke, they were writing the New Testament. They needed miracles. They needed miraculous power. There is some language in the Bible that this language does not apply to me, nor does it apply to you. John 16, 13. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. That doesn't apply to any preacher today. That applied to the apostles and apostles only. John, the 14th chapter, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. <coughs> Some years ago in Long Beach, California, I engaged a Pentecostal preacher in debate. And he contended that he had the same power the apostles had. He could speak in tongues. He could do all of these things, you name it, and he could do what an apostle could do. Well, I thought of this passage. It had been quoted. And I thought, now here is a good time for me. Here's a man who claims to be inspired, can do what the apostles could do. And all of those hard names over in Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy of Christ, so-and-so begat so-and-so. I don't know any preacher in the brotherhood can quote all those names, pronounce them correctly. Now here's a good chance. I asked him, sir, have you read all the New Testament? Hundreds of times. All right. Now apply this passage of Scripture. Bring your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Would you quote Matthew chapter 1? Let the Holy Spirit bring it to your remembrance. You know he couldn't get verse 1. He couldn't get verse 1. Johnny, he reached up to grab his Bible, and he was going to read it, and I grabbed his Bible and put my hands on it and said, No, sir, you quote it. He couldn't. Proves man doesn't have that kind of power that the apostles had. Miracles confirm the word, according to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4. There are a lot of people who do not understand this. The word of God's already been confirmed by miracles. My friend Pat Boone never did understand this. He believes, believed and does believe <coughs> that every baby is born. The Holy Spirit has to perform a miracle and confirm the word to that baby. Well, when the Supreme Court meets in our country and confirms a law, it does not have to reconvene to every baby that's born and reconfirm it. It is confirmed for all time to come unless superseded by the enactment of a more recent law. The word of God has already been confirmed and we don't need any more miracles and we cannot improve upon the teachings of men who didn't have to think what they had to say. They didn't worry about how they said it because the Holy Spirit would give them in that same hour what? they should say. But you know today, we're hearing subjects preached from pulpits that we didn't hear 50 years ago. I feel sorry for our young people today. I really do. Young people, now around here you've been hearing the gospel. But there are hundreds of young people in the church today who have never heard a gospel sermon. 50 years ago, we heard sermons, <coughs> preachers preached, on the subject of the status of the church. They preached upon the subject of the kingdom. They preached upon the citizens of the kingdom. 
They talked against the erroneous doctrines of uh, premillennialism, transubstantiation, anthropomorphism. Well, you might say, what are all those doctrines? I don't have time to tell you now, but you need to hear some preaching about them. If you had lived a few years ago, you're getting up here now. <clears throat> if you had lived a few years ago, you would have been hearing the things about the Bible. You know the problem that preachers who know the Bible are having today? They have to deal upon the subjects of the first principles of the Bible because members of the church today do not have enough biblical understanding so you can go down, get down to the bottom of the barrel and pull out the deeper things of the Bible. So we're having to preach today upon the first principles, the minor things, many of the minor things that you read about in the Bible. Really can't get down to the deeper things of the Bible. What a tragedy. I don't know about how it is here, but out in California, there is a unity and diversity doctrine. In other words, Joe, don't uh, upset anybody. How about sin? Sin in this congregation. Leave it alone, Joe, and it'll die. There's some air out here. What am I going to do about it? Joe, can we talk about this? Uh, let's get together for breakfast, a number of men. Now look, Joe, if we let that alone, it'll die. Now you don't mean that. Why? Are you telling me if we leave sin alone in five years, it'll die? Why, absolutely not. That would be like saying, if you tear down all hospitals, stop all research on the AIDS virus, that in five years the AIDS, AIDS virus will be done away with. It'll just go away. Will it? Well, you know and I know that that's wrong. We're hearing so much today about we're under grace, not law. I'm hearing that in California. I go to Tennessee. I hear it. I haven't heard it in Texas, but I'm sure it's here. Young preachers today think they're preaching the same things that denominations are preaching. They're trying hard to preach exactly what denominations teach. And they really think they're teaching about grace and law, what denominations teach, and they're not. Why? Well, grace means favor. Grace means favor. But the Holy Spirit idea that's among the denominations they believe in a direct operation of spirit and conversion. That's force. The Bible says we're saved by grace. That's favor. The denominational idea of grace is that it is force. If we can just learn how the Ephesians were saved, then uh, we will know how the Ephesians were saved by grace. Turn to Acts, the 19th chapter, in verse 5. This is the Ephesians. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Isn't that simple? We're saved by grace, not by force. The denominational idea of grace is direct operation of the Spirit. That's force. So we're not saved today. God does not use irresistible drawing. You can resist the Holy Spirit. You can resist the Bible. In Acts the 17th chapter, or the 7th chapter in verse 51, here we find Stephen saying, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. The Holy Spirit, the Bible, can be resisted. And Stephen said it could. We're saved today by gospel preaching. And if you'll look, in every case in the Bible, in the book of Acts, upon divine conversion where people were converted, there was a sermon preached first. On the day of Pentecost, they heard Peter's preaching. They were pricked in their hearts and said, Peter, the rest of the brethren, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37 the case of the eunuch. Philip preached unto him Jesus. 
actually eighth chapter. The case of Cornelius. He shall tell thee words whereby that thou and all thy house shall be saved. God draws through moral teaching. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I hold in my hand the greatest code of principles ever clothed in human language. God draws through his word. Believe it. Read it daily. And obey it. And enjoy its great and sacred promises forever. Some in this audience may never have rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Friend, listen to me. If our Lord were to come tonight, would you be willing for him to find you in disobedience to what he commands? Surely not. God draws through his word. If you're now led by his word, want to obey the gospel, we're here to assist you. We don't ask you to come to us. I have never preached, come to me. I've never heard a gospel preacher say, come to me. We ask you to come to Christ. And while together, we stand and sing. Won't you come to Christ? <laughs>